You're listening to a Roddenberry Podcast. You're listening to Mission Log the Orville, an episode-by-episode discussion of the adventures of the crew of the USS Orville. Welcome to another episode of Mission Log the Orville. This week, Domino, the one where the crew of the Orville listen to Fats Domino while eating dominoes while playing dominoes. We'll discuss the meanings, morals, and messages and see how it stacks up against the Roddenberry Star Trek philosophy. My name is Mike Richards. Are you, sh- are you sure that's what the episode was about? I think that's what it was about. All right, I'm Jessica Lynn Verde. Mission Log the Orville is a conversation that depends on your participation. Please share your thoughts, ideas, and tell us what we missed at ML underscore the Orville on Twitter, Mission Log Pod on Facebook, or email us at missionlog the Orville at roddenberry.com. If you're watching this on the Roddenberry YouTube channel, hit like and subscribe. And remember, we just might use your comments in an upcoming episode. Regarding Midnight Blue, Mm. Heather Gillum wrote on Twitter, Thank you for another great show. You two bring it every week. Dance hands, star eyes, teary eyes, (laughs) heart and heart hands. You are the Andy Cohen of the Orville, the talking dead, on the pulse, poignant with the spirit and soul of the show. Great quotes, great comparisons, insight, the whole bit, 50,000 thumbs up. This comment made my... Day. I saw I saw your response to it. Um, she's very enthusiastic and, and uh, I think a newer follower of ours. Anyway, she's awesome. I want to give us the flip version of that, Mike. Someone, I was looking at our uh, reviews on Apple Podcasts and someone says that we should leave our politics out of this and we got we did we got that one it said uh who wants who doesn't want more mission log but uh you and i we yeah, uh, have us. a have a have a liberal agenda or liberal politics we should leave uh, out of it something like that now yeah i uh first of all people i don't know if you know reviewing and putting a star on our podcast even if you don't like it does help us so thank you for going to the trouble and reviewing and telling us that you don't like our politics but i think i think i'm a little biased about how awesome i am i think that (laughs) while it's clear we're both on the left-leaning side of things we do propose other thoughts and have shared um not been afraid to disagree with each other have have been have been able to be open to other ideas i argue that if you say that we shouldn't have politics in the show which is by the way about a show that's very political to begin with you're the one being close-minded because you don't want to be challenged to your thought that's my argument but i also appreciate their uh criticism I do. You know, all feedback is good feedback. Um, Even if it's the wrong feedback. Yeah, there's positive (laughs) and negative. There's useful and not uh, useful, as I learned from uh, from a good friend of mine. Um, So feedback that's useful, uh, whether it's positive or negative, is valued. Um, And I am also quite biased as to how awesome you are. So we have that in common. (gasps) Oh, that's so nice. Anyway, Mike, I think it's time for you to recap this week's episode. Domino. Prologue. A Mocklin delegation visits Talea in the Krill capital of Dalakos. The Mocklins want to form an alliance, Mocklin weapons, for Krill protection. Two great militaries against the Kalon and any other union of planets that they might find troublesome. Great, but who will lead? According to the Mocklins, they would, of course. Leadership by a female would be offensive to the Mocklins. Man, do they have balls or what? Talea makes a counteroffer, co-leadership or no deal. The Mocklins have to confer with their people as we head to the opening credits. Surrounding Salea, a Union fleet is forming a defense against the Kalon, while Isaac and Charlie work on a device in engineering. As the Kalon attack the Union ships, Ed orders Isaac to initiate as a massive pulse emanates from the Orville, destroying all of the Kalon ships. The crew looks on in utter dismay as Ed and Kelly slowly rise from their command chairs and walk closer to the view screen to survey the damage. When Isaac asks if they were successful, a distraught Ed answers, Yes, you could say that. Back on Earth, Admirals Perry, Halsey, and Ozawa compliment Isaac and Charlie on their ability to create such a weapon. 
Isaac explains that the weapon works by attacking the Kalon network. Attack one Kalon and you knock them all down like, that's right, dominoes. Isaac won't be affected since he's no oh. longer part of their network. <laughs> Uh, furthermore, a bigger power source means virtually unlimited range. That would have been a good time to say unlimited power. Unlimited power. The conversation turns to the possibility of eradicating all Kalon. Charlie agrees enthusiastically, but Ed asks if they're being a little too cavalier in their approach. After all, aren't they talking about committing genocide? Kelly points out that the Kalon capacity to grow and learn has been proven. Admiral Halsey ever the voice of reason, says it's not their decision anyway, it's up to the Union Council to make the decision, and there's nothing they can do about it. Back on the Orville, John, Charlie, Gordon, and Tala discuss the pluses and minuses of genocide. John and Tala are against, while Charlie and Gordon are pro, showing us that the Union is likely divided on the subject. In the conference room, Admiral Halsey shares the Council's decision that the weapon will be used as a deterrent. The Orville will travel to Kalon to demonstrate the nature of the device and give the Kalon an opportunity to agree to a ceasefire. Approaching Kalon, the Orville is met by so many Kalon vessels. The weapon is ready as Admiral Halsey implores the Kalon to stand down. As the Kalon attack the Orville, Ed orders the use of the weapon, destroying the attacking ships. Getting the attention of Kalon Primary, the Orville is allowed to land and discuss their terms. The Union demands are simple. Stop the hostility against the Union and stop trying to eradicate the biologicals. Kalon Primary asks the Union if they will enslave them, and without missing a beat, the answer is no. We simply want to find a way to peacefully coexist. Why? Because the Union believes that the quality of mercy is the mightiest in the mightiest. With no defense against the weapon, the Kalon agree, but not without throwing some serious shade at Isaac and promising to find a weakness in the weapon. The gang, celebrating at Kelly's cabin, are entertained by Gordon and Charlie performing an acoustic version of Simon and Garfunkel's Flowers Never Bend with the Rainfall as congratulations, ancient rum, walnuts, astronomy lessons, and moral quandaries are shared. Meanwhile, 32 levels underneath Union Central, Lieutenant Shady Pants breaks into the facility where the device was being kept, helped by an accomplice on the inside. Making quick work of their escape, a shuttle is seen going to Quantum just in time for Admiral Halsey to break the bad news to Kelly and Claire. The shuttle with the stolen device rendezvous with Mocklin and Curl ships delivered by Admiral Perry. He believes the Kalon will inevitably find a way to render the device obsolete and want the newly formed alliance to get the Kalon while the getting's good. Returning to Earth to turn himself in, Talea orders the destruction of Admiral Perry's shuttle. Following the shuttle's trail, Bordas detects the weapon signatures of Mocklin and Krill vessels. He surmises that the Mocklins will seek the help of Dr. Kalba on Draconis 427, as he's the most brilliant weapons scientist available. Sadly, Draconis 427 is extremely well defended, while hosting a quantum core large enough to use the device to destroy all Kalon within 10,000 light years. Knowing when to ask for help, the Orville contacts Kalon Primary to work together and either recover or disable the weapon. The Kalon and the Union will attack the Mocklins and Krill in orbit while a squadron of Pterodons, that's right, Yay! Pterodons, led by John and Gordon, provide cover for the go team of Kelly, Tala, Isaac, Charlie, and Kalon Primary as they infiltrate the facility and make sure the weapon isn't used. An epic space battle ensues as the GO team makes its way to the surface, accompanied by the Pterodons. With the shuttle damaged, the team uses their egress packs to, you know, egress the shuttle rocketeer style and backdoor their way into the facility. The team fights their way through the Mocklin facility as Charlie, Isaac, and Kalon Primary make their way to the weapon. With the weapon armed and no way to stop it, Charlie tries frantically to find a solution. Meanwhile, Kelly, separated from Tala, is ambushed by Talea. Looking like she's about to be a gift for Avis, Tala <sighs> provides a well-timed blow to Talea's big krill head, proving that Aww. krill heads are way tougher than John Lamar's. Kelly, catching up with the rest of the team, learn that the only way Charlie can destroy the weapon is to overload the quantum core 
destroying the outpost and a good chunk of the planet, and Charlie will have to do it manually, leaving her to sacrifice herself. The team takes off in a Krill shuttle, but not before Kalon Primary looks back, silently questioning the nature of Charlie's decision. Moments later, Charlie's eyes reflect the overloading quantum core as she utters the words, I'm here, Amanda. Safely aboard the Orville, Kalon Primary asks, the biological terminated her existence, but why? To save you, Kelly answered, because they are not like the biologicals that created us, added Isaac. Kalon Primary admits that they may have been incorrect in their assessment of the biologicals. Looks like the door may be open for peace after all. In the brig, Ed tells Talea that she will be charged with war crimes. He offers to provide a good home for Anaya. She refuses, stating that the fulfillment of a divine purpose eclipses all family bonds. At Union Central, the Kalon are offered provisional membership in the Union. They agree that while a representative democracy is inefficient, as Admiral Halsey puts it, all other forms of government are inferior. At Charlie's memorial service, Isaac is the first to speak. In the final seconds of her life, Charlie substantiated her true nature, one of integrity and sacrifice. And in her sacrifice, she inspired the enemies of the Union to become friends. Her existence was brief, but much like the first domino in succession, her impact will be felt far into the future. The end. Thank you, Mike. That was a gigantic episode to recap i thought i had it hard in midnight blue last week i think this one was you know i think there was a lot of action and a lot of um uh minutes that were not necessarily didn't necessarily drive the plot so i think you actually probably had more to talk about in midnight blue i did keep out for that exact reason the chase between the shuttle and you know, the Mocklin shuttles after they get um, Topa because it, it's just too much, right? right? But but yes, you're totally right. Like you can go, and eh, they're destroyed, moving on. Or and, and we've been trying to keep the recaps to about the same length that we had with 45 minute episodes. Even this one came in at about an hour and 18. It was the second longest one um, after Midnight Blue, which was an hour and 27. Amazing. So very, very long episodes. Um, so far, with the show only being out for about a week, it's got a 9.4 on IMDb, which is the highest, highest uh, above uh, Identity Part 1, I believe. Yeah, and uh, the, I, of, I was the, actually, of the entire series. I was just looking at IMDb, too, and it's at Movie Meter 23, which is not bad. It's not the highest it's ever been at for the show either, but I think what we're seeing are people just enough people talking about it, enough water cooler around the mm-hmm. internet is positive, and people are going, I guess I'll watch this. And and then if you drop in this week to see this episode, or if you've like caught up in order to get to this episode, you really got you really got a treat. Yeah, and I read a Forbes article today that said I guess everyone was right about the Orville was what it was titled totally. um, that showed up on my uh, one of my social media feeds, and yeah, it was a guy that reviews uh, pop culture for Forbes, and he was like, yeah, they were right, the show's awesome, um, and this exciting. one. In- particular and i'm hey man you know we have you know andre borman is friend of the show brandon braga we haven't had on here yet hopefully in a future supplemental um really really p- pleased with the quality of the episodes that those two have been putting out um you know because they did uh midnight blue uh, right. which we kind of knew right away that this some stuff's going to go down when these when these two folks write it right and in this one as well well we had andre bormanis and brandon braga as the writing team um john Casarlane as the uh director on this one co-directed what? uh mostly jeff? With, with seth mccasarlane sure yeah jeff jeff, jeff. jeff. <laughs> Mick Casarlane, yeah, yeah. Nice and music for only the second time this uh, in New Horizons, I believe, by Kevin Costa. And they killed it. Yeah, um, and then with a credit I hadn't seen before, it said with additional music by John Debney because he was responsible for the arrangement of "Flowers Never Bend in the Rainfall" by oh. Simon and Garfunkel. Which I, I said acoustic version, but did Simon and Garfunkel ever do anything like not acoustic? Like, I don't think they ever had like a jam band. Well, I mean, Mrs. Robinson, right? I mean, I still think yeah. it's acoustic, but. Ish. Um, I 
am not going to say something that I don't know to be true. Definitely a lot of acoustic and a lot I would of say, or harmony. Yeah, yeah. Simon and Garfunkel was, is very. Um, I'm There's sure they did reasons. things that were not acoustic, but they, it has a very acoustic flavor. About There's re- it. There are reasons that Simon left Garfunkel in the wind and why Garfunkel never got over it. So, and primarily it's, I'm sure, electric guitar. So. Yeah, prob- probably is. Um, we had Graham K- Hamilton back as uh, uh, Kalon Primary. Mm-hmm. Um, Kai Wenner and BJ Tanner making appearances. Um, Nick Chinland, we haven't talked about him before, but he played uh, the Krill Captain Dalek. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he's been around, you know, since season one, I believe, oh, the episode wow. of Krill. Um, this will be fast work, that guy, you know, because sure. he just has just he just has a very sort of old school uh, commanding presence. Like when I was when I first started out in the airline industry and I was flying with guys that were, you know, Vietnam vets and, you know, folks of, you know, that certain age, they kind of had that that same sort of grizzled uh, way about them. Mm-hmm. And it was it, to me, it was kind of, uh, you know, I'm glad I'm not you know necessarily uh, under somebody like that's command. But uh, sure. it did bring back a. Um, there's a certain sort of Triggering sort of confidence. Oh. No, there, there's just a certain like you know confidence and presence and just you know I, you know I like my commanders to be in command and feel like they are you know sort of the masters of their of their domain so to speak. Sure. Um, Lisa Baines is back. Uh, Monty Pullum as Topa. Uh, Michaela McManus, who we've raved about uh, on the show before. And Ren T. Brown was back as Commander Codon. We saw him last week. Right. And I had to look up a word. I'm so glad you did this. An asterism. Con- a context clues, I think I understood it. But sure. I've also misunderstood plenty of word because right. I thought context I had it correct. Yeah. So well, please. You, well, we all know you have the best vocabulary <laughs> of, uh, among the two of us. Um, but I heard uh, Isaac describe the Big Dipper as being an asterism in the constellation Ursa Major. Um, so I thought, okay, so that's probably like a little chunk of a constellation, like a little like a little piece of one, right? So the Big right. Dipper and the Little Bipper, Dipper are both, you know, they're called that euphemistically, and they're both part of the constellations Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. Mm-hmm. Uh, but an asterism is, an, is a term in astronomy, a prominent pattern or group of stars, typically having a popular name, but smaller than a constellation. Interesting. Yeah, so that's where that came from. And another little bit of trivia when... Bordis sensed the um, Mocklin and Krill weapons signatures. Um, and Kelly looked right at Isaac and said, verify that? I was like, aw, doesn't anybody trust Bordis? I know. It was, like, again, a real Worf situation. <laughs> yeah, no, but- Worf, we're not doing that. Is he, is he an idiot? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, kind of a big deal. I guess you want, you know, to, to double, verifica- double verify it. And, Verificate, you know, two I source, love it. Two-source verification. You know, that's, that's right. The, that's the thing. Um, Tufa, got it. And, and Ed said... It's the Molotov ribbon trop all over again. And I was like, well, that sounds like something I should have heard about in history class. Um, it was a non-aggression pact between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union that they pretty much cut up, a, you know, made a side deal that they would uh, partition Poland between the two of them. So within uh, a certain time period of this pact being signed, uh, Germany uh, invaded Poland and then so did the USSR. Like, not shortly thereafter. Mm. And uh, as most of you know, during World War II, it did not last because they were the fiercest of enemies uh, during World War II. Um, so, yeah, that was the uh, that was the Molotov Ribbentrop. It's pretty deep cut, Ed Mercer. Although we do know that Ed Mercer has some uh, reverence for the 21st and 20th century. And, um, and? this is placed, uh, this is episode nine. Mm -hmm. Uh, The novella, The Orville, Ah, Sympathy for the Devil, was positioned as episode 8.5. I did listen to that on audiobook the other day. It's available on, you know, wherever I got mine on Audible. Right. Um, But it's available wherever you get audiobooks. And I listened to it. It's about a little over three hours long. And it is um, narrated by Bruce. I believe his official middle name is Effing Boxleitner. (laughs) And... (laughs) It was fantastic. So I could see how there would be some 
prior knowledge of World War II possibly associated with that with that episode. For sure. those of you who care to dig into that, that's great. That's amazing. Hey, I acknowledge acknowledged that uh, you just did all that really well. Acknowledged. 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 <laughs> Acknowledged. It went on. I think it went on for about. You know, it was kind of maybe it was kind of like the version of like of like Red Five standing by. Yeah, Red Leader yes. standing by. Red yes. Five standing by. Red Three standing by. It was a hundred acknowledged, 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 acknowledged. <laughs> In some ways, it was just kind of cool to hear. Like, yes, everyone has heard this, and they're all agreeing to go to their death. Mm-hmm. But also, like, what the, f- what are we doing here? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, 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 I acknowledge also that they basically, this episode is a Star War. This episode is, uh, Brandon Braga said at the um, panel at Comic-Con that he believes that this show has the best VFX at, on TV to date. And he says, before this episode came out, the best is yet to come. And he was so correct in that assessment. And so... In my, that, it, I, all I could think, even when they see the planet where the quantum core is, that looked like um, the Death Star a little bit. And then they kind of look like it kind of looked like Star Killer Base. Mm-hmm. All right, and I know I, that you, I know you saw Episode Seven, and we talked about that not too long ago. Spoiled for you, if I remember right. No, wait, you didn't. You didn't spoil Episode Seven. For no, me. no, no. But you said you uh, you Twitter spoiled it yourself. Oh, oh, I sure did ruin that for myself. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's it, that's exactly right. I, I'm going to be honest. As I was watching certain promos leading up to the last couple of episodes, when you just see a ton of Union starships, I'm like, that looks really cluttered. What are we doing? Why are there so many ships? Yeah, so you're talking about well, they never they never said it. So Talea said that you know Salea would be one of the first planets attacked, and I saw those those gorgeous rings around the planet um, and the and the large moons, and I I kind of made the assumption that that was Salea that they were oh it sure was they even said they did say oh they it. did okay mm-hmm. um, and I saw the ship sort of backing up like tail to tail to tail, and all I was thinking and this is uh, this is more of a uh, Chris Berman Sports Center reference, where he'd always say nobody circles the wagons like the Buffalo Bills. What and I was does thinking, that mean? Oh, you know, it just means defend themselves. You know, like keep see. keep from keep from getting blown out or come back uh, if they're if they're in a tough situation. Gotcha. And I was just thinking, nobody circles the wagons like the Wait, Union fleet. That was actually. I mean, it was kind of cool to see how strategic that was. Mm -hmm. I guess what I'm trying to say is when you just see, like, a a shot of, like, 700 Orville ships. Yeah. I I was – I don't know if I had it. If I was incredulous, but I was a little skeptical. But they've really justified having these space fights and multiple ships in one shot. Like, because to go back to Star Wars – you know, yes, there's TIE fighters and there's like in, you know, in space fighting and on planet fighting. Mm-hmm. But some of the criticism that the first three episodes drew was too much. Like there's right. too much, much fighting on screen. So I was a f- skeptical that they were going to tow that line incorrectly. I think they towed it just perfectly and earned it. And you, because you want you, they, we saw everything we needed to see, and they didn't give us like hyper fast cuts, which is another technique that they did in the 2000s to like hide right. what was really happening with explosions and stuff like that. We just got to see some really great. It sounds a lot like Transformers 2, the second one. We are not here to disparage Michael Bay, although I will do it any day. <laughs> any day. Well, keeping the Seth MacFarlane connection going, I just watched three directors the other day on the Family Guy episode. Oh, okay. where they where they were oh. episodes direct you know, the same story directed by Wes Anderson, uh Michael Bay. Yep, yeah. And uh I'm drawing a blank right now. Uh, but I so like, yeah. so much fun. It's a what a clever what a clever way to do an episode for sure. Especially when you've been on for as many seasons as that. You've gotta get Got to get clever. Oh yeah, and that, and I just did guest uh, uh, guest appearance oh, on yeah, tell us about um, that. the Sci Fi Sanctuary. Um, uh, Matt Comages uh, with with Matt and Luke, and they uh, we talked about Armageddon, which was early Michael Bay. So you kind of see the the proto proto Michael Bay techniques that were that were going on. I guess. I should be careful. There's some things that Michael Bay did, and then he became a parody of himself. And the same thing could be said of Wes Anderson, whom I love. So, mm-hmm. you know, 
you, like even I have theories and it's such a digression from what we're talking about but like you get the raw version of someone's work and then you get the distillation the perfect version of their work and then they start becoming a parody of themselves Danny Elfman not Danny Elfman um, what's who's the guy who he works with that friggin guy you know Musical.ly Beetlejuice nope Beetlejuice oh Michael Keaton no, no, no. Um, but my, yes, he's in that the the director okay. Tim Burton. Oh, so Tim have, Burton. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have like Beetlejuice, uh-huh. like it's like raw and amazing. But then you have like the perfect distillation, or even have like scissor hands. It's raw, but then you get Nightmare Before Christmas, and it's the perfection of the genre. Right, or right. you know, you get Rushmore Bottle Rockets out of Tenenbaum uh, out of. Um, Wes Anderson, and then you get Royal Tenenbaums, and it's mm-hmm. perfect. And then it starts like becoming a parody of itself. But also, they've honed their own vi- version and vision, and so it can go good or bad. And Michael ba- Michael Bay really has a style, <laughs> is what so, I will say. It, it really does. And a couple things to circle back to: uh, Quentin Tarantino was the third director, along with uh, oh, Wes Anderson right. and Michael Bay. <laughs> so it was, it was that was that was fantastically done. Amazing. And also the uh, that Star Wars skit uh, from Family Guy, where. Um, uh, Luke, you know, finds that Uncle Owen and Aunt Feru are dead, and then John Williams is dead, and they had to do the rest of the film with Danny Elfman's, Elfman's music. So, and I remember telling the story on an earlier version. I do, I drew a blank on Danny Elfman's name. That's right. So I'm That's glad right. you brought that up because now, uh, you know, for our long term <laughs> listeners, they can they'll finally have that uh, that loop closed up for them. We, you have closed the timeline, and I'm really grateful. And we're trying, we're trying to wrap these all, the, all these open uh, plot holes up in the last uh, last couple of episodes. I don't of, blame you. Of New Horizons. I don't blame you. Um, so something I found interesting is uh-huh. um, remember when you had said that there were I think they said three actresses that were pregnant during right. the time of filming. Yeah. I don't know that I would have noticed this. If you hadn't shared that information, but Talia is sitting a lot in this episode she stands oh. but she's sitting in sp- and there's something kind of cool about that visually where that she doesn't need to stand for a man who walks in the room mm-hmm. she doesn't need to stand to command but that got my mind ticking thinking i wonder if she's a little bit pregnant and i did look on uh, michaela mcmanus's uh imdb and it says that their third child daughter indigo Irene Daniels was born May 12th, 2021. So more than likely she was right in either having some sort of sickness or something or other. A lot other. of COVID babies running around. <laughs> this is true. It's late, one day after Meester. my birthday. Yeah. So. Late, oh, nice. Yeah. Um, Leighton Meester was pregnant. Uh, Jessica Zor, uh, I follow oh, her on wow. uh, Instagram. And she's got uh, she's got a picture of a wee little baby who's running around kind of so kind of about mystery. a year old. So I think okay. that might be uh, might be another because I think there was I think there was a line delivered by Kaline primary that I mm-hmm. that a question um, is when they were getting ready to jump out of the uh, jump out of the shuttle. Right, because they they didn't have landing thrusters. They're going to have to take power away from something else to get them back. And they're like, "Nah, let's just jump out." And Kalon said, "At our current altitude of five thousand meters above the ground, we will need to reach terminal velocity before we initiate reverse thrust." I think that I think the words "need to" might not have should have been in there. Okay. Um, because uh, terminal velocity is when you're falling and you accelerate. Uh, and then the the wind resistance kind of starts to equal the acceleration of gravity, so that your velocity just stabilizes. So if if you were to throw something off the Empire State Building, um, eventually it would ex- it would go faster and faster and faster until the wind resistance kind of equaled the pull of gravity, and then it would just be going at the same speed, the, huh. a constant speed, and right. that's called terminal velocity. Okay. Um, and that could be different, you know, with a pointy option, a pointy object that has less wind resistance than like a blunt object. Um, but uh, I think what Kalon Primary was saying was that our current altitude of 5,000 meters above the ground, we will reach terminal velocity before we initiate reverse thrust. And that kind of makes a little bit more sense at that point when Charlie just said, just hit the button before you hit the ground. And that was kind of a badass moment when she just kind of like flopped out of the shuttle like that. It was actually very cool. Uh, uh, I thought it was a nice subtle nod to JJ's uh, when they're all flying down uh, out of the ship too. Even though I know it's nothing to do with Star Trek, but right. So yeah, you had that scene. That. 
Uh, there was that, and then like all the Mission Impossible stuff, where they just kind of flop out of airplanes. And- I'm just gonna say though, to your credit, I I actually understand less what Caleb Primary was trying to do now, and I just felt like he was trying to be like I'm the smart one, and she's like, I, so am I. Don't don't make it don't overcomplicate it, man. Just Correct. hit the button before you hit the ground. Yeah, and amazing. I think, yeah, so I just took it as you know we're gonna be going really really fast. Um, you know before we can initiate reverse thrust she's like just hit the button before you hit the ground you'll be fine and i, I thought that was it. pretty pretty cool um do you notice the similarities but i guess i guess oh, yeah. have pretty standard architecture i think they have standard architecture. <laughs> they do. maybe kind of like non-standard lighting but uh, uh, standard yeah. architecture <laughs> i think the deeper you go the the, the darker or bluer the lighting gets right because um, it was kind of orange and yellow highlights i think last week let's just put it this way the fox parking lot is is it just giveth and giveth and giveth and <laughs> we, they got a lot of mileage out of the fox parking lot i'm so glad you noticed that because i mean it doesn't matter and it's amazing and it's so simple but it was funny just you're right it has to be the same architecture so architecture so that totally worked yeah i don't sense. i don't i mean you're, you you got a mocklin uh uh black ops mocklin detention facility or interrogation facility and then you got here you got a, a mocklin research facility and if that's if they like to make their halls kind of you know octagonal or whatever the shape was i don't know would who are we? Good, Maybe good it, just wor- it just works for them. Uh, so I think half of this conversation ends up uh, on the other part of our podcast where we get to the ethical and moral part of things. But De- Talia is deplorable, right? He says oh, that. She yeah. is contemptible. She is beyond, in my opinion now, um, saving. There was a part of me that really, really was hoping that we could just see her do another turn and just going realize. back to nothing nothing left on earth excepting fishes i think we all wanted that you know and she left and only a woman's plan or more than you know whatever always a woman by billy joel was playing i think we i think we had hope now i don't I, think we have so much hope the only hope we have the real thing that ed's fighting for clearly is anaya the daughter but it so you reminded me that um I came across this on the internet, as one does, and when you pointed out that Talia was like the the higher calling of, you know, is more important than familial bonds. I I hate this person, but Dr. Phil, I was interviewing this guy who's a TikToker who got famous for licking toilets and ice cream and stuff. He's just a dumb kid. Licking. Literally licking toilets during COVID and then like licking ice cream and putting it back. Like, this is how he got famous. And at first, I'm like, this is a joke, right? This guy just knows that he's like going on to Dr. Phil to be famous, more famous, sir. And he says to Dr. Phil, I don't talk to my family because they're not relevant. They don't have any followers. <laughs> they don't have enough followers. And so I don't waste my time with them. And then the only credit I will give Dr. Phil, he says, uh, well, I must be out of it because I've I only heard of you t- today, so it, like, <laughs> offended this kid so much. But it, it it's not at all like what Talia Talia is saying. But like just to get it in your head that the familial bonds, there are times where you do need to cut familial bonds for your well being and health. Yeah. But Talia's um, religious fanaticism and her ego and her own hubris has driven her past a point of redemption and i'm bummed about that i i am too um because because i did think there was a point where (laughs) and i remember when we had when we were doing the supplementals between uh season two and uh when we were done covering season two and before uh new horizons came out where we were like you know are we shipping ed and kelly are we shipping ed and talaya like what's uh what, what you know who do we want to happen here and now talaya sadly has has definitely gone gone off the deep end as we've seen people do <laughs> over the last couple of years um whether that be family members or sure. friends or, or other folks um but over the deep end she has gone now can she come back uh. i i i don't know if she will um, you know, but I think she could. I think Ed hates her. I think yeah. he hates her. That doesn't mean he doesn't love her. Doesn't, but I think yeah, it doesn't mean they her. can't co-parent in a responsible way. <laughs> I don't think she wants to. <laughs> uh, you know, I do give this show so much credit for really not always resolving things in a way that we want them to, especially with this episode 
even the previews for what we were going to get, I had no idea what to expect. I had no idea. I, it was impossible for me to wrap my head around how they were even going to be able to resolve things with the Kalon. Uh, uh, so like it was just so cool to see them not only figure that out but then give us another problem of like like they just really have a, a real unique knack for not wrapping things up in a bow but still giving us like what is really potentially able yeah. to be happened K- kind of that short term you know short term issue being solved and kind of like that bigger greater story arc and and also the character development too and the way the power shifted between you know we have the Mocklins and the <laughs> And the krill together, um, and potentially the the Kalon as being part of the the union, which which does shift things. But I do want to point that out because when I said Mocklin, I started laughing because we were just starting to like Clyden, right? Like, weren't we just starting to like Clyden? And then like poor Fortis can't even can't even penetrate the meat inside the shell. <laughs> Stop. Of Stop you know, it. their words, not mine. Their words. <laughs> I didn't make up those words. Um, can I could not even properly penetrate the meat to Clyden's satisfaction uh, without just uh, without just I guess for lack of a better term emasculating him at the party. Yes, I think they. <laughs> this might be foreplay for them though, because we also see some shirts coming off in the pro- preview for the. Uh, season finale so we'll see i have one more question before we move on to the next part of our our show have at it ted danson how do you feel about it he has kind of reminded me from the beginning of his sort of sort of his you know hardline um kind of kind of hawkish um stance as kind of admiral marcus in star trek into darkness yeah a lot of people Um, are drawing that yeah and he's just sort of acted like that like he's like we gotta do this who's gonna do it you captain mercer you commander grayson um and he didn't go there but he kind of always had that sort of vibe to him sure in my mind um you know a little bit of jack nicholson and a few good men a little bit of um like i said admiral marcus um is he right um, you know, genocide. I don't think we condone genocide here on uh, Mission Log the Orville. And, and I, I didn't we'll get ask to that, that. Here, in a, here in a little bit. Um, I asked R.I.P. R- Ted Danson. Did he get the right go? Uh, did he get did he get the right send off? Did you did you buy the heel turn? I was su- I was surprised that it was. I think I was surprised, but not too surprised yeah. yeah that it was that it was he who delivered the weapon um then the second or third time i, I watched the show and i listened to his you know uh distorted voice uh-huh. i was like boy that does sound a lot like ted danson right you know, distorted that could just be my you know imagination filling in the blanks though Certainly. um but i, I think of him thing, i think of him it was our and uh halsey that it was going to be he who did that and we, you know, we talked at one time about you know sort of the brand of the admirals, you know, where you know Danson, Admiral Perry was you know kind of the war hawk, the um, you know uh, Victor Garber was the voice of reason always, and Tucker was just you know played by the great Ron Canada, is um, you know it was just Admiral No, he would just tell everybody No, and he asked what's what's Ozawa's brand, and I, I really didn't have an answer, and after this episode, I really don't have an answer either. She just kind of repeated what the other people said like Danson was like hey so if you got more power you can give this thing more range right and she was like so what you're saying is if you give it more power it'll have more range I was like well thanks Admiral Ozawa like that yeah that was line there were lines that were just spoken and the same kind of thing at the end where they were talking about the um I think they were talking about their their possible membership in the union she just sort of repeated other lines so I'd like to see Kelly who get you know more to do than that because i think she's an amazing uh, amazing actor and you know strong character but just just sort of not she was kind of just there to be there in this episode sadly right. i thought i can see that um i think we did get to see her do a couple of good things including helping um kelly go to rescue the delegation mm-hmm. um but i think you're right a little bit more definition in that character it's not going to hurt us um, right. Especially when we did have clear cut, we know what Garber does, we we know what Danson does, and it wouldn't be wrong to, to give her a little bit more to flesh out. What do you say we take a swift interlude and see each other on the other side? I will interlude away and then reconvene. Okay.
So we've come to the part of our show where we're going to explore the big ideas of the episode Domino and discuss the meanings, morals, and messages to see if it aligns with the Roddenberry Star Trek philosophy. What do you got for me, Mike? Well, I think this was definitely a much more targeted episode than, you know, what we've had the last couple of weeks that talked about so many different things. Like, you know, we've talked about, you know, very, very long lists of, of topics that were, you know, explored um, that we didn't even kind of get to have to, one of which was... Um, uh, from Unknown Graves, where we kind of mm-hmm. did our wrap up, and I said, "Man, I had this list of you know twenty bullet points. I don't even think right. we got to you know uh, five or six of them." Um, but uh, this one, I think, is much you know much more targeted. Um, you know, a few lines I wanted to throw out there is I loved uh, Admiral Halsey's line where he said, "We believe the quality of mercy is the mightiest in the mightiest." And you that know, really gave me pause in like an, an awesome way. Yeah, and it reminded me of a line in a film um, that I saw a number of years ago where a guy was concerned about his daughter being out with people. And he said, you shouldn't hang out with people like that. You could get hurt. And she said, strong guys don't hurt you, Dad. Weak ones do. And I just thought, wow, that was so good. Um, and this is the same thing. Like, you, if you really are you know, secure and strong and, you know, have a strong sense of self, then, you know, you, you would have that restraint. You can see that, that quality of mercy as, as being a strength, not a weakness. Whereas if you're insecure and trying to prove yourself and, um, you know, have a Napoleonic complex or, you know, some other diagnosed or undiagnosed (laughs) issue um you know that 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 would cause you to uh maybe try to overcompensate then maybe those are the folks that don't maybe appreciate the quality of mercy the way others do i i think that that's a perfect way to put it and a really great way to to give us the analogy in today's society um the 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 weak man (laughs) never have i seen a, a more toxic person than the one who has the most to prove, right? Right. Or, yeah, they're more dangerous. That's so interesting. Um, I also loved how uh, he pulled the Napoleon uh, quote out of out of his back pocket, right? Like, a, a broken qu- clock is tr- right twice a day. And right. Napoleon was right that if you can get your enemy to submit without violence then you've won the war, essentially. That was kind of... That really was. I mean, so, you know, a lesson learned there. He said, although he was a tyrant, he was right about that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, also a good a good lesson that even though um, somebody might have some, you know, some, some faults, like, uh, you know, aspiring to world domination, there still may be something you can learn from that that individual, <laughs> uh, which, which they did in here. I liked... I also thought it was... I liked the... Um, the line where um, the the group it was Ed Kelly, Isaac, and Charlie at least, and then you had the admirals on the other table, and they said, "How'd you accomplish this so fast?" And Ed said, "Well, to accomplish great things, you you need two things, right? A plan and not enough time." And somebody said Churchill, and then Isaac said, um, "Some Lavar composer. Burton." No, <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't Lavar Burton. Although it has a Churchill vibe to it for yeah. sure. It was a uh, it was a a composer. I see. Okay. Um, but yes, yeah, so I thought that was. I thought that I, I I would have bought. I perfectly would have bought Churchill. I wonder, out of the two, is Brannon or Andre Bormanis bringing those a lot of those quotes or pulling from source like that? I, I'm so I don't curious. know, and I really I'm I'm also very curious as to this writing team because every other show that we've that we've seen other than the ones written by this team are a singular writing credit written by seth mcfarlane written by david a goodman written by joe minoski um this is and we did have one written by joe minoski i went back and looked the other day and i and i kind of chuckled um because i looked at uh, anyway, regardless, I looked. I was looking at some old episodes. And I was like, "Oh no!" Uh, but a singular writing credit. Whereas this one, these 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 two dudes always write together. So it's. Uh, right. I kind of wonder why and why that di- dynamic came up. And um, clearly, they've been working together for years. And and uh, you know, the stories are really really paying off. Whereas um, you know, I think I think 
I think an argument can be made that, you know, episodes eight and nine, Midnight Blue and Dominoes are, you know, the strongest of the season. Um, and I don't know that everybody would feel that way. I don't know that I feel that way. I just feel like they are definitely two of the strongest. I am, I don't think I can disagree with you. I don't think I want to disagree with you. I, I tend not to look at things in that way. I tend to go, do I really like this season or do I not? But I think mm-hmm. you're, I think the way we looked at it early on, and I think it's holding true, we're ramping into something amazing. I think, I think you're starting to see more excitement on the internet because they're doing such wonderful work. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, there's definitely like, it's almost like, they kind of all knew this was going to be an amazing season. They were all saying, too, it's going to be a barn burner, going to be a barn burner. Well, you know, like Seth said, he said this, he said, when you look at shows that kind of find their footing, it's usually around season three. I think that was a direct comparison to Next Gen. Sure. And he said, they're going. we said, we're going to look back at New Horizons as the year we swung for the fences and swing, they'd swing and hit it out of the park. 100%. So far, so far. I- and a great point was, a great point someone said on the internet, it's like, they gave us this episode and there's still one more. You know, right. like this very well could have been a season ender and there's still one more. Yeah. Which brings me to something where I think we're going to differ still. What differ? I'll learn something from you. So, so, so well, present. I think I'm still figuring out how I feel about uh-huh. a part of me hates myself for hating Charlie Burke. As much as I did. Right. <laughs> or really not letting her be r- redemptive. Um, but at the same time, she really, she did have an arc. But do you think she actually be- became less bigoted? Like she actually, or did you think she was spiteful up to the end? What do you think? I'm trying to give you an answer. I'm trying to get, put words in your mouth. Do you think she yeah. actually redeemed herself besides sacrificing herself? So there is a school of thought that says, regardless of what you think on the inside, it's your actions that count. So you can be bigoted. You can think that way. But as long as you treat everybody nicely and don't let that get the best of you, does it matter? Um, It's sort of an interesting question. If you have these thoughts inside your brain, but you never act on them, does that make you a bad person or a good person? If you treat everybody equally and give people, you know, give people an honest chance and you, um, you know, treat your coworkers and, you know, if you're in a leadership role, promote people and encourage people, you know, the right way to do it. Does it, does it matter what your internal motivations are? It's just kind of a philosophical question. Um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to absorb it because yeah. a real part of me is actually bucking up against this as an idea. Mm-hmm. Um, but but go on. I, I'm... Uh, so w- I, I feel like she came a long way when she was working with Isaac and Timis. I, I really do. Um, I don't know that she necessarily got all the way there. But I think she got a long way there. Even in this episode, when you know the admiral was like, Admiral Perry is like, get to work on increasing the power of this thing so we can eradicate the Kalon threat. And she was like, okay. And right. I mean, it's, it's an admiral. She's an ensign. I get it. But Ed was like, whoa, oh, hey, time out. Aren't we being a little too cavalier? I mean, this is genocide we're talking about. So even at that point, she was very willing to you know, commit the act of genocide, which, um, you know, in some background uh, quotation on this episode, Andre Bormana said it was the the biggest episode they've explored to date on the show, right? It's the, it's the ultimate evil. And she was kind of willing to go right along with it. Um, when she was asked to increase the power of the, of the, the weapon. Now, at the end of the day, if her sense of duty and her sense of, just you know right and wrong um sort of dictated her actions to over and follow her you know the orders she was given like she said which was to you know disable or retrieve the weapon and the only thing that she could do is you know disable aka destroy it then that might have just been a sense of duty and she may still have had a deep-seated hatred for the kalon for killing her um for killing amanda um 
you know, the question I have is, you know, was she all that interested in sacrificing herself or did she just want to, you know, try to be with in some way Amanda, which and then you have to kind of kind of think about her belief system and, you know, what you know, where she how she would answer the mortality paradox question right. and right. what you know, how she thinks things would look like after she dies. Um, I honestly think that she was probably struggling with all those questions. You know, she even asked him at the. Uh, at the cabin, you know, are we doing the right thing? You probably think I'm a terrible person for wanting to wipe all these um, uh, Kalon out. But I think at the end of the day, she did the right thing. And that's all we can really judge her on. Um, hmm. I, th I think the impact is felt by primary one, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. Due to the fact that he knows that she doesn't, she doesn't really like them, but still made that choice. I think it was right. more a reflection on our society as a whole mm -hmm. that we do let the good win out ultimately. Um, I I don't I don't know that I a hundred percent love the philosophy of like, hey, you could be a bigot in your head, say all the slurs that you want in your head, and I, I'm I'm hyperbolizing. Yeah, in your head. Fair. <laughs> but 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 I can't imagine that still not dictating a normal everyday person's actions. I will right. say this, however, um, something that someone helped me with a little bit ago was you're not your first thought. You're usually your second or your third thought. So the right. first thing that comes to your mind might be the conditioning, indoctrination, mm -hmm. or lesson your parents taught you about X, Y, and Z, which I've been very honest about being raised whether purposely or inadvertently to have certain prejudices which we all kind of can't really get away from so there's a time there was a time where like i would be so sad that what my first thought would be i go am i am i that i can't believe i'm thinking that but the fact that i can go wait no that's not true because i've seen this x y and z um someone helped me with a little bit of patience and said it's just, the fact that you're getting to the second thought or the third thought is probably probably the real reflection of who that's, you are. That's the core really, adult person. That's really commendable because as you said that, and I'd never heard that before, I, I think about my, often my first thought. And the first thought's usually, you know, kind of take the easy way out. You know, sure. first thought's kind of like nobody's looking. First thought's sure. you know, kind, of, kind of along those lines. Um, and I don't think my actions ever reflect the first thought there you go and um, i'm not saying my first thought is to be you know a bigoted against you know um artificial can, artificial life forms but uh, <laughs> it can run the gamut though of yeah. all sorts of things so if the reason why i learned you are your second thought was i was expressing feeling disappointment in myself when i was uh, watching a lady in the crosswalk um, and judging what she was wearing. I was judging that she didn't fit her like tube top well, or that she was, I know, I know. And I, but then I caught myself and I went, what did, what does my opinion on what she's wearing matter whatsoever? She's probably fine. She's happy. She doesn't care what she looks like. And yet, and yet I'm over here judging. So I expressed, um, disdain for that thought to a friend. I was like, does that make me such a bad person? And she said, that second thought you had is who you are. The first thought is your conditioning. And so um, I, I, I don't know that I can 100% uh, say with certainty what Charlie's first th or second thought was. You know what I mean? Right. Um, I, I will say this. I, I was I I'm sure some people clock this right at the top with her introduction. I didn't realize that her whole destiny was to die. But it makes sense because her partner died or someone that she wanted to be her partner died. Um, I should have seen it coming sooner. I didn't. It was a really shocking moment. Um, surprising, especially after killing Admiral Danson. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I do regret a little bit um, for my dislike of the character, but at the same time, she wasn't perfect. She wasn't afraid to voice her opinions, and she died doing the right thing. Yeah, I mean, she was very, she was very capable. She was very smart. Um, she was, 
Yeah, maybe it's not somewhat, a reflection on her skills at all. Yeah, no, it just just maybe somewhat. Um, you know, when I look back at 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 me at that age, you know, thinking I knew everything, thinking I was smarter than folks that had been around the block a lot more than I had been, um, thinking that I knew more than people that that were in my field for mm-hmm. you know twenty, thirty years, and that I could somehow either talk down to them or. Uh, maybe that my opinion mattered more. I thought mm-hmm. my opinion mattered oh, more than it did. Nothing's like, worse like see, than a nineteen-year-old. Yeah, like like I see a I saw a lot of you know my younger self and Charlie Burke um, at different times during the season, and um, again, you know, I don't know where you know what her first or second thought was, but you know, at the end of the day, she did sacrifice herself um, to save. Um, honestly, you know, to save a to save a war. Mm-hmm. And I think that I think that means a lot. So, still, um, you know, if I go back and rewatch this season, and I'm sure I will, I'm probably not going to like her anymore in episodes <laughs> one through one through seven or so. Uh, but after that, I think it's there's uh, um, there's a lot of sympathy to be gained, and the fact that knowing that you know where her arc ends, uh, I think will go a long way to. Um, make me judge her a little less than maybe I did early on in this season. I wasn't my my first thought of Charlie Burke. <laughs> <laughs> I'm my sec I'd like to believe I'm my second thought. Um I guess I just don't want to be the kind of person who's like, "Oh, you know what? She's great." And like like walk back my initial disdain for the no. character. But I kind of really that keeping that into consideration, what an awesome, successful job they have done with the show to get us to have strong feelings <laughs> about a character, whether they're good or bad. Right. They really got us all to be like, well, damn. <laughs> We all have an opinion on a character. That's really impactful storytelling. It really is. You know, and it kind of, to a lesser extent, it kind of makes me wonder what I think of Gordon Malloy, too. Because he was always kind of like right there on the Charlie train with uh, starting with Electric Sheep when he was like, you know what? You're right. A lot of people feel the same way. And even in this episode, when they were chatting about the uh, the pros and cons of genocide right. in the mess hall, he was like, you know what? She's not wrong. And uh, you is know, he just I, trying to get laid? Well, I don't know, no, but I, you know, not, I, I will I'm, say I'm this, glib. and and this goes back to my early days uh, with the airline, is that um, you know they often say that uh, twenty five goes into fifty a lot better than fifty goes into twenty five. So Whoa. I think I think if Char- I think if Gordon was just trying to do that, he was probably wasting his time. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a phrase I'll never get a handle on, which is six of a dozen and a half a dozen. Like, what's the, I can never oh, get that phrase. Six of one, like, half dozen of the other? Exactly. That, I know yeah. it's not exactly what you mean, but that's uh, that's another one I'm going to try and put in my pocket and remember. Yeah, so, 25 goes into 50 better than 50 goes into 25. <laughs> uh, try, try that, math people. We don't, I don't do math. Um, so I think... Uh, the one other thing I think we can uh, I want to remark on before we move on into our the way the way we end this show normally is um, the the send off for the character, including Isaac's eulogy slash you know speaking, was just gorgeous. It it really was, um, you know, and again just just going back to Mark and what he does, what he can do with that character. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I went back and, you know, for the recap, which uh, I tried to kind of make our hour and a half episode recap the same length as a 45 minute recap. Um, but I did specifically, you know, jump into that. Um, Charlie substantiated her true nature, one of integrity and sacrifice. And in her sacrifice, she inspired the enemies of the Union to become friends. Her existence was brief. But much like the first domino in succession, her impact will be felt far into the future. That was, man, that was just so well written. Very gorgeous. And it, and it made the name domino that otherwise elicits pizza when said. And fat totally domino. worth it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, just to be fair, what's the first thing you're thinking? It's dominoes, just to be fair. Ooh, I wonder why dominoes calls themselves dominoes. 
I don't want to. I don't know that I care, but now I want to know. If anybody um, knows, hit us up on Twitter. Yeah, they were asking the tough questions here. So, what, what if at all does this show, if not, could be potentially uh, Star Trek Roddenberry philosophizing? Well, thesis. I mean, I mean, just ge- genocide. Genocide is bad, you know. I mean, we've. Oh my God, I mean, that, that's a good takeaway. Yeah, I mean, there's a, uh, you know, like they said, that was, you know, probably one of the bigger, bigger issues that they've explored. But, you know, Star Trek did a, um, you know, a genocide episode in the original series with uh, the characters where some of them were white on the right side, all of them oh, were yeah. white on the right side. But Mike, my people are black on the right side. But Mike, Star Trek's never been political up until now. No, no, it, it's you know I don't know when it got all political. I don't know when it got uh, representative. I don't know when it got uh, you know Leftist. inclusive. <laughs> uh, yeah, when it got uh, uh, when it got progressive. I, I I don't know. You know, I it, it just it just probably Alex Kurtzman brought all of those things. You know to, what I do love this Trek. echo chamber that you and I provide for each other. <laughs> just love hearing my my ideas bounce right back. But me. but there was a, there was a lot of the original series that was sort of um, you know very you know, kind of pro America at the time like like you know by it was a huge f- value of, of Americans at the time yeah so Patriot at the time people say like you know what's the point of Star Trek and it's they're like it's better to be human and it's you know than a machine or an alien or you know somebody who can't think it's better to have that 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 sense of morality that america that uh, excuse me mm. that that humans have hmm. that uh that maybe you know in in many ways early early star trek kind of held up you know spock as being flawed because he didn't have that hunch he didn't have that emotion he didn't have that extra something that that made him a great leader like kirk was look at galileo 7 um where spock just failed horribly until right. he, until he did the one irrational thing which is jettison the fuel and light it on fire uh because he just tried to lead by logic logic and not yeah, I remember you know, that episode. anything else um so yeah they were like you know it's better to be human and by human we mean american and by american we mean you know kind of uh you know patriotic and and almost sort of you know uh, uh towards the right on the political scale there there was a lot of that in the original series it was you know but we're going we also was less than what we're experiencing right now yeah, yeah so so when you know when things were said like you know we call it freedom and you're going to enjoy it a lot that was that was very much you know kind of the the america at the time which believe it or not was much more less to the right than it is now like I, I have been compared to, you know, I mean, as as liberal as our, you know, one listener thinks thinks that I am, um, it's pointed out to me time and time and time again that I'm more of, you know, what would have been a conservative probably in the Eisenhower administration or even, um, uh, I'll go back that far. That's it. But but it really it really has been. So so the country has moved further and further right. So what was being espoused as maybe conservative in the sixties was more um is is probably considered much more left now than it was then. Right. And it's not a new concept also to be fair and say that neoliberal neoliberalism is also dangerous as well. No mm-hmm. one eats each other better than the lefts against the lefts. Um I I I think I just caution hearing something e- even when I see something that I don't agree with I have to exercise better control in order to uh, try to understand where someone's coming from. Right. It's not easy. And we had a com- I had a conversation with a good friend of mine. This is going back to probably 2014 and um we were actually we were we were flying together a three day trip, and at one point he said like man you're judgy, and I was like you think, and he goes yeah, and um, you know I took the uh, the personality test what is it Myers Myers Briggs yeah sure is that it you know and the mm-hmm. NTSJ thing and you know I, f- I came out where I, f- I found out where I came out on it and it was I kind of liked where it was I had a guardian personality I try to kind of protect and support other people which which I and defend them um, which which I which I was proud of but I did sort of see what he meant when I when I kind of dug into that so now my my while that may be my first instinct um i do very much try to uh control that and 
think of okay why am i judging this individual and like you said it's you know probably more likely than not conditioning uh, it probably is uh, but i but i've seen you be a great example i know i know it's primarily because you respect me i know that you don't walk into a situation res- disrespecting others but i've seen you and uh, you've inspired me to just go oh I'll, i can learn i can see why mm-hmm. i don't agree with this um yeah, if anytime we don't see eye to eye, it's I don't I don't think we're just getting along for the sake of the podcast. You know, I think um you No, do a people great want job. us to fight. I I know. <laughs> you know what? Maybe next episode. But that was about the time in my life when I was like, okay, I've I've got of th- this is a fork in the road and I can either solidify my views and stop evolving or I can try hard to keep evolving. And that was, you know, sort of, you know, kind of the beginning of my, uh, I'll say next act. I'm not sure if it was second, third or last, or maybe even my encore. I don't know, but it was kind of, <laughs> it was kind of a, uh, a, a moment, a watershed moment in my life. There are, uh, life is made up of a couple small moments just like that where like even a friend of mine today said wow you bring up this one specific event a lot um prime and i do because i changed a lot because of that moment and it was a drop in the bucket but that person saying that one thing to you impacted you Mm -hmm. enough to set you on a new course yeah it kind of helped me re-examine some tendencies that i didn't know i had And that could also just be their view as to whether it's negative or not. But I do Mm -hmm. think some healthy awareness around who we are. And even the Myers-Briggs test is deeply flawed and apparently has uh, roots in racism. And it's it's like, it's it's got, I know. But (laughs) like, even like with astrology, I don't know that I'm a Taurus and I'm this way. But if I read something, it helps me to understand myself better all the better you Mm -hmm. know so i think that's the big takeaway there um so yeah i think you're right genocide is and you know the other thing i want to talk about this and this was just such a perfect other side of the coin from last week's episode because because last week we you know i went on my my lecture of the needs of the many and the needs of the one crowd versus the needs of the one outweighing the needs of the many and look at everybody in the planet every delegate that stood up at the planetary uh, union of the council chambers were putting their security and their well-being at risk to 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 save Topa and to kick the Mocklins out because the needs of the one, the needs of that individual person, outweighed the security and the and the well-being of the many. Um, this episode was Charlie Burke sacrificing herself because the needs of the many outweigh the one, needs of the one, and y- you can't really have one without the other and it all depends on who's doing the sacrificing right it just depends you know throwing somebody overboard because the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the one is not cool (laughs) you know but uh it all depends on that so i love the fact that we had one great episode that was one side of that coin and another great episode that was the other side of that coin because i really do think that both of those are equally important based on the situation I think you hit the nail on the head. I think you flipped the coin on the bed. I think, All that's, right. I think that's it, Mike. <laughs> okay, good deal. Uh, Mission Live the Orville is produced by Roddenberry Entertainment. Technical production by our friend Earl Green. Our website and your opportunity to comment and connect with us is podcasts.roddenberry.com. If you're watching the live premiere on YouTube right now, join us on the Mission Log Discord as soon as it ends to continue the conversation. If you don't have access, go to patreon.com slash mission log and join for as little as $1 per month. Join us next time on Mission Log The Orville as we discuss the season three finale, Future Unknown, and how apt is that name? This is a Roddenberry podcast. For more great podcasts, visit podcast.roddenberry.com.